Uh, my name is Veronica Cianfrano. I am the curator for Melton Gallery. Um, and my role here is to be moderator um, for this panel discussion. Just to give you just a quick overview of uh, what we're doing here for Melton Gallery, my goal for this space is to build an environment where everybody, no matter the background, feels invited to engage with the work that we show. And my purpose is to show work that's relevant, contemporary, and speaks to who we are and where we are um, now. I, I'm trying to sort of erase the boundaries and the the failures of the art world, in my opinion, um, that are based in elitism. So I, I want this place to be really welcoming. Um, so if anyone has any questions, comments, um, please feel free to share them. There are no bad questions. <laughs> uh, so to that point, just really briefly, um, because that's my goal, we have programming that backs that up. <laughs> so we have Lunch and Learn Tuesdays uh, that are going to be starting very soon, January 19th. Uh, there will be workshops on hereditary, racial, and historical trauma and that will be here in the gallery and that will be done with um, the Counseling Center here on campus, uh, which is run by Julie Reed, who is one of our panelists. Um, Dreamer Ally Training. Uh, for faculty and staff here on campus um, to learn about DACA and the DREAMER Act and to learn how to best serve students uh, on our campus. Uh, trauma Recovery Series, this is uh, group discussions on how to heal from trauma. And then we'll have a closing reception which will be open to the public uh, on March 4th. So I hope to see some of you at some of those events. So uh, I want to start off by telling you a little bit about why we're here today. So Ada Trio, La Caravana del Diablo, is a solo exhibition of, the, of Ada's powerful award-winning photographic series documenting the lives of individuals in the migrant caravans traveling through Central America to the Mexico-United States border. Tonight's panel discussion will serve as a tool for doing a deeper dive into the intent, the subject matter, the content, and the context of Ada's work. Each panelist here has a unique expertise, experience, point of view that can help provide a more nuanced and fleshed out understanding of the caravans. We are live streaming now on Instagram at UCL Melton Gallery. Viewers at home can ask questions at any time in the comments section of the live stream. And I have a wonderful staff that will read them for you. They will be your voice. Um, so at any time, if you have a question, put it in the comments. And they're, they're continually scrolling to check. Um, and we'll do our best to answer all questions at any point throughout the, the panel. So without further ado, let me tell you about who our panelists are. First, Ada Trio. She's a Philadelphia-based photographer, native to Juarez, El Paso by National Metroplex. In her work, she focuses on border, uh, borders of inclusion and exclusion as they are experienced through people in forced prostitution, climate and violence-related international migration, and long-standing borders of race and class. Through the elements of documentary and fine art photography, Trio lays bare our common humanity and dignity and brings attention to the impact borders have on exploited and marginalized people by amplifying their voices. Trio's work is in the permanent collection of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. She is the recipient of the Female in Focus 2020 Best Series Award and was recently featured in The Guardian, Vogue, and Mother Jones, among other publications. She has also been awarded the Me and Eve grant with the Center of Photographic Arts in Santa Fe and received first place in editorial with the Tokyo International Photo Awards. Trio has exhibited both nationally and internationally in New York City, Philadelphia, Luxembourg, England, Italy, and Germany. She holds degrees from Instituto Marangani in Milan and Drexel University in Philadelphia. Julia Reed is a licensed clinical social worker and the senior director for the Counseling Center. Wave hello. 
that's Julia Reed. She leads the team's efforts for prevention and intervention on our campus. She has a focus on nonprofit management as well as direct service delivery in areas related to mental health, child development, trauma parenting, trauma parenting, sorry, <laughs> mindfulness, and disaster response. Julie has been a committed and connected nonprofit leader impacting change for those served within organizations. Dr. Chad Perry, who is on our television screen uh, participating via Zoom, is an associate professor of strategic communications at the University of Central Oklahoma. He holds a BS in journalism from Kansas State University, an MFA in creative writing from Wichita State University, and a PhD in communication from the University of New Mexico. Dr. Perry is accredited in public relations by the Public Relations Society of America. He served two terms on the PRSA's Universal Accreditation Board and was involved with developing a computer-based examination for the APR test. Because of his contributions to PRSA and his involvement in numerous professional and social activities in New Mexico, Dr. Perry was introduced into the prestigious PRSA College of Fellows in 2013. He worked as a reporter photojournalist for three years before changing careers and received the E.H. Schaffer Award in photojournalism from the New Mexico Press Association. He has a passion for documentary photography and incorporates that into his research. Dr. Perry conducts research on international communication, I'm sorry, intercultural communication, diversity, race relations, and race portrayal in media. His dissertation was a three-year study of an adult ESL program in New Mexico. He is currently a member of the UCO College of Liberal Arts, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Group. Dr. Don, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Father Don Wolf, if you would raise your hand, is a native of Oklahoma City and an alumnus of Oklahoma State University. He was ordained to the priesthood in 1981 and has served in a variety of parishes throughout Western Oklahoma. He is currently pastor of St. Eugene Parish in Oklahoma City. Father Wolf was a founding member and chairman of the Commission for Justice and Human Development, chairman of the Board of Catholic Charities, a board member of the Latino Community Development Agency, a vicar of Hispanic Ministry for the Archdiocese of Oklahoma City, and chairman of the Board of St. Gregory's University. In 2014, Dr. Wolf received the Oklahoma University Human Rights Alliance Award in recognition of his involvement with the burgeoning needs of the Hispanic community in Oklahoma. Sarah Bobbitt, at the end here, is the Director of Immigration Legal Services at Catholic Charities of Oklahoma City. Prior to joining Catholic Charities, she created and led the Immigration Legal Services with Sacramento Food Bank and Family Services and worked as a private immigration attorney. Ms. Bobbitt's practice is focused on visas for survivors of crime and human trafficking. VAWA, Asylum, SIJS, Family-Based Immigration, DACA, and Naturalization. Apart from direct service, Ms. Bobbitt enjoys conducting community Know Your Rights presentations and presentations on broader immigration issues. So that's our panel. Can we give them a, a round of applause? <laughs> Thank you all again for being here. Um, so just a quick overview of how this is going to work. Each panelist, uh, as you can tell by their bios, has a background that lends a unique perspective to this work that can help kind of flesh out the overall context behind everything and help us get a richer understanding of the content of Ada's work. Um, my hope is that this will be more conversational. Um, so each, we'll go down the line and each panelist will give us their experiences and their expertise uh, on, their as on an aspect of the subject matter. Um, and at any point, if you have any, a question, feel free to raise your hand and we'll try to address it. Um, I quickly, I used to be a teacher, so I love bullet points. Um, so uh, this is what my personal goal is for this panel. Um, number one, it's all about context. So to provide as much context as possible because um, humanitarian crises are so nuanced 
and human beings are so nuanced that to paint any person with a broad stroke would be a disservice. So um, my goal is to provide as much information and as, as nuanced a point of view as possible so that people can think critically about the mediated images that we see on a daily basis, uh, particularly of the caravans. And I want this to be a place for us to share, share our experiences, um, our thoughts about the work, um, and to share actionable items and resources. I call actionable items any, any um, thing related to advocacy. Um, so just really briefly, um, I want to show you an example of why I wanted to show this work in the first place, just so you have my two cents before I step back and just be a moderator. <laughs> um, for me, I, I saw Ada had an exhibition in Philadelphia, which is where I'm originally from. I had never met her, but I saw the work and I kept the postcard because it was so powerful. And a year and a half, two years later, I moved to Oklahoma. <laughs> And I got this job as a curator here, and I have the opportunity to put on exhibitions that I feel are important and that are relevant. And her postcard was the first one that I, I pulled up because I said, this, this lady needs a solo show. I got 1,800 square feet. Let's make it happen. <laughs> um, so the reason uh, I felt that way is because this is what we always see. Images like this in the media. Um, and the thing that's wrong with it, uh, just from the standpoint of someone who dissects images her whole life, uh, it's from far away. It's, from, it's using a telescopic lens from a helicopter. So the people don't have faces. They don't have identities. They are not individuals. They are grouped as one mass. Um, I mean, they could be ants. They don't look like human beings from this far away. And then everything has a meaning and a symbolism in an image. It has a symbolic purpose. So if we are above a large group of people, then we are looking down on them, right? So it further dehumanizes them. This is one of Ada's photographs from the exhibition, taking uh, at the same river and you can immediately see the difference the big one being she's there with them she's not above them she's experiencing the thing that they are experiencing at the time that they are experiencing it um, you can see she didn't use a flash she's not uh, sacrificing their safety to get the shot One more image. These are all. These images are taken from Associated Press. They've been used countless times in the New York Times, uh, various news outlets. What we see here, again, a faceless mass of people, again, using color photography. Uh, we see the police being encircled and swarmed by asylum seekers. You look at this and you feel chaos. You feel like, again, this is a sort of a conglomerate mass of people rather than many individuals experiencing the worst day of their life. Versus one of Ada Trio's photographs taken 500 feet from the border. Who is outnumbered? Who are we making eye contact with? Who do we see every detail of her face? The individual. So this is what makes this work important to me, and this is what makes it powerful. So just wanted to kind of start it off with why, why I wanted to show this work. So we're going to start off um, with Ada Trio. Um, and 
Ada, I'm wondering if we could just kind of start off at the beginning. Tell us a little bit about how we got here. Well, um, I have two major women in my life that made me the woman who I am now and make me create the work I do. And one of them was Pola. Her real name is Amapola, was Amapola. Um, I don't have a picture of her because my mom never took one. Uh, she was my nanny. And she had, she was a migrant. She had been in El Paso living, had a child, was deported into Juarez, and then uh, went to work for us. This woman gave me an incredible amount of love and care. She was, I had post-traumatic stress, stress disorder, still do. And she was the first person to play dolls with me. She just hugged me with love. And then the other person was uh, Guillermina Valdez, my aunt, where when I happened to be naughty, my mom would send me to my aunt's. And that was great because not only was she a scholar, but she was also an activist. And she started El Centro de la Frontera Norte in Juarez, at the Center for Migrant Studies in Juarez. Uh, and also she started a cooperative for factory women in Juarez. And her life was that of service. What do you do for others? Uh, how do you make your life great? You serve. And those were, and she also taught me, everybody has a talent. Even though you may not be doing good in school right now, you have a talent. And when you discover it, use it for the good of others. So I discovered late in life that my talent was the camera. And that's how I'm here. And then, so that's sort of the personal um, thing that drives you to be the photographer that you are today. Um, but there's also this political background, right? Yeah. For uh, I feel that what the policies that we have uh, right now towards asylum seekers and displaced people are extremely unfair. And um, I have something to say about it. And the way I have to say about it is through my pictures so people can learn visually mm -hmm. what's going on. So I travel uh, with migrants and with asylum seekers their journey to show you exactly what is it like, mm -hmm. that journey. So when you encounter, uh, are you in a position where you are with a person that is undocumented, you treat them with the ultimate respect because now you understand what they went through in order to come here. Yeah. Uh, and what's uh, important, and this is also in Ada's uh, exhibition statement, is to understand the reason that people are fleeing their countries. And so these are just some statistics, a few bullet points. Um, you know, one of the main things is sort of what led to the gangs in uh, the Northern Triangle. Did you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, well, we had, it's, it's, it goes in tears, right? So we had the Reagan era, Right, where a lot of people are fleeing. He's uh, supporting the elitist regimes in uh, Central America. So many people are fleeing during that time. Mm -hmm. And then those, uh, those people end up, a lot of them end up in Los Angeles. And what happened to the children of these people are that they're being threatened by the local gangs in Los Angeles. So they start forming their own, such as La Mara Salvatruz, La Mara Salvatrucha, MS-13, or Barrio de Ciocho. Well, what happens during Clinton is that he started the Im immigration, immigrant, oh, sorry, immigrant, illegal immigration reform and Im immigrant responsibility act, where he sent them back to their countries. So instead of imprisoning them or finding another alternative, it's like, let's send them back. So now this caused a horrible problem in Honduras, in the Northern Triangle, which is Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, 
because we have a corrupt police and uh, a lot of the teenagers are now thinking, oh, this is the U.S., this is the way it is, uh, and they get, they, they feel like it's glamorized. So they become, start becoming members, and then they start forcing people to become members. So people start fleeing because uh, they can't deal with the violence, deal with the extortions, with the killing, with the raping. So people start escaping the Northern Triangle. They don't leave because they just want to come to the United States to see what, a, what an adventure. That most of the people that leave is because they have no other alternative. So we have personal, we have the political, um, and then the artistic. Yeah. So I'm a self-taught photographer, and I um, look and study a lot photographers that I really admire their social practice, social change practice. Mm -hmm. And um, these three photographers, Dorothy Lane, Sebastián Salgado, and Graciela Iturbide, have really influenced my practice. Um, I look at their philosophies. Uh, more, I also look at their work, but I never try to replicate something that they have already made perfectly. I try to learn more. What is it that they that they're trying to say? Why they're trying to say it, and how I can apply that to my artistic practice? Right. So, for instance, uh, Dorothy Lane is says the camera is an excuse to show you how to see without a camera. And that has been a great lesson to me when I'm working. Uh, in order, Sebastián Salgado, uh, he has done countless uh, so, social, um, I, social justice photography. Yeah, mm -hmm. around the world. And he helps you see it with your brain and with your heart and understand it both ways. Mm -hmm. And with Graciela Iturbide, I uh, have looked a lot at the videos that she does with people that she's photographing and how she approaches people. And the way she does it is with such love and such respect that is really a lesson to me on how I, I approach others. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about your experiences uh, working with the caravans and following along with the caravans? And So here is La Bestia. And prior to the caravans, uh, we have the freight train Ferro Ferromex in Mexico that covers from the border of Guatemala in Mexico all the way to the border towns between Mexico and the U.S. And it's a series of trains that connect among each other, and the migrants have to be catching them. Uh, you never know when the next train is coming. These are uh, the migrants right on top. So, and these are the different um, border towns where it will lead you. Uh, it is extremely, extremely dangerous because you have the cartels. Uh, who target the, mi the migrants uh, for small kidnappings. Uh, they'll do, they'll ask for a phone number and then they'll ask for a Western Union of $2,500 from the families uh, to, for the migrant. Otherwise, they'll kill them. Um, so this is just with the cartels. They, they can fall off the train. They, unfortunately, the police in Mexico is very corrupt, so they will steal from them. It's just not a good situation. But it's the only way that they can transfer, that they can uh, travel the length of Mexico because Mexico is quite big in order to get from Central America to the border towns of the United States, where they can then. Uh, turn themselves in to port of entry and ask for asylum. Yeah, because the train is a freight train. It's a freight so they, train. They have to jump onto the train while it's in motion. Um, and that's how they are losing limbs and getting injured. Um, so we have close to 300,000 people taking this train yearly. Um, 
around 68,000 unaccompanied minors. And again, one of the things we have with unaccompanied minors from Central America is that the gangs start recruiting them at the age of 10. So many families send them alone because they rather they go and try their luck in America that they end up dead in a gang in their own countries. And here is an example of somebody that got severely hurt. And then another one of, of the migrants on top of the train. I took these pictures in 2018 prior to the caravan. And then we have the caravans, right? Because it's safety in numbers. So now people are together leaving and protecting each other and become a, a community, a family. And this is in San Pedro Sula, Honduras, which is one of the most violent cities in the world that is not in war. And this happened this January 14, 2020. And it's the beginning of the caravan as they're leaving. It was approximately 4,000 people and in little groups. And this became my group. This is Conchita, who reminded me a lot of Amapola, the woman that raised me. And then Eva, Alejandra, Brian, and the, this became my group. So you, the caravans are usually a bunch of micro little groups within a big group. Mm -hmm. And everybody looks out for each other. Everybody looks out of, after each other, but you are usually in a micro group. Yeah. This is Luis. Uh, we have the problem with the gangs, but we also have problem with um, parents abandoning their children and having children from the streets. And this is the case for Luis. He is now in an orphanage in the state of Tabasco. Um, and one really sad thing was when I hugged him, I could feel his bones. Uh, and I will never forget that. So at least now he is safe in a place that is taking care of him because his parents failed to. So you have the unaccompanied minors issue of those that have been abandoned by their parents, but also those that are being uh, gonna be part of the gangs. Mm -hmm. Please excuse my English. <laughs> Great. Uh, this is in the shelter of El Cebu, and I have a lot of affinity for my LGBTQ community. Um, uh, I met Ashley in the while we were washing the clothes, and she was just laughing. Did you never done this? <laughs> Give me that. And what I gave her was my underwear. She <laughs> was washing. She didn't care. Uh, and then she let me take her picture, and she told me that her life had been in danger uh, because she was a trans woman, and that is not accepted in the Northern Triangle. Uh, they actually have among the highest uh, murder rates for trans women in the world. Um, they put them in a detention center in Tabasco, but the trans women were put here in the shelter. They put the trans women with the women. In the, shel in the detention center in Mexico, they put them with the men, uh, which was horrible. And then they were deported. Oh, one thing I wanted to say about that picture, that should have not be in a case because under the 1951 Refugee Convention, She's a member of a, spe of a specific group and who should have been given at least the opportunity to apply for asylum. Because she's a targeted, she's a member of a targeted group. Yeah. Here is in Tecunumán. Uh, the shelter was uh, very busy and so we slept in the, in the floor. And you were saying more often than not, this is more, most likely what a shelter would be like in the caravans yeah we like there's very limited space mm -hmm. and the when it's a caravan the majority we end up sleeping in the floor like in a park or something and 
then here we're crossing the Suchata River around 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. And two days prior, they had been, uh, they, the, they tried to cross the Suchata River during the day, and they were stopped by the Guardia Nacional. This time, we're trying to cross, and I have my heavy backpack, and I'm like thinking, if this is full of rocks, if I fall, I'm not gonna be able to stand up and I don't know what I'm gonna do. So I asked this random guy, Alex, can, can you hold me? And he said yes, which I don't think would have happened if I would have done it in another country or with another group of people, but Hondurans are just so kind, so nice, that he said yes, and he don't, not only walked with me and hold me, but like didn't mind that I was taking pictures. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you can see the kindness of heart of the people. And this is Joel. Alex was holding a pair of uh, crutches. And Joel went swimming in the river because he had one leg. So he couldn't walk with the crutches in the river. So Alex gave him the, the, the crutches at the end. But you can see now, what can you possibly go through to traverse two countries with no leg, a river? You know, what the circumstances have to be extremely drastic for this to happen. People are just not living just to, you know, an adventure. It's, there, ha there is a very solid reason. This is after we crossed the river, a little bit afterwards. Uh, we were walking, and I start seeing the military trucks, and more military trucks, and then the white buses, which are uh, from the government. And I'm thinking to myself, this is a problem, this is a problem, this is not good. And lo and behold, we meet a wall of the Guardia Nacional, the National Army. And they start the asylum seekers and migrants were saying, queremos paz, queremos paz. Nope. Uh, they tear gas children, as if this case, uh, adults, and shove them into buses to be deported. Now, this happens. Mexico has had a policy that has allowed for the safe travel of passage of migrants through its country on the way to America for decades. But Trump said that he was going to impose tariffs on Mexican goods coming to America if they didn't stop the caravans. Mm -hmm. So then Lopez Obrador, the Mexican president, sent the Guardia Nacional to stop them. So this is like just inhumane beyond belief. And for me, these are not my subjects. Like in Florida, these became my friends. These became my family, the people that kept me safe, that I travel with, that I eat with, that I share stories with. So to see this is extremely painful. And uh, for those of you that have seen the exhibition, this is the only photograph where anyone is crying in the picture. Can you talk a little bit about that? My work is not for you to feel sorry for uh, the asylum seekers and the migrants. That is not my objective. My objective is for you to feel respect, for, for, uh, for them to have dignity, and for you to understand their circumstances better. But not for you to feel sorry for them like a little dog. That is not my intention. My intention is respect. But in this case, I thought it was very important to show somebody, that, especially a child, that had been hurt by such an inhumane policy. So we'll pause for a second for it. Does anyone have any questions so far? Yeah. Okay. This question is for anyone. What do you believe it will take for immigration to become an easier and less brutal process? So what, what do we believe it will take for immigration to become a less brutal process? Does anyone want to take that? This was for everybody? Yes.
Well, I think we need to come to grips as a country with a white, serious white supremacy issue that's happening right now in our faces. Um, and our lawmakers need to, whether their constituents push them or not, um, have a spine and pass some immigration reform that will be meaningful for folks. Yeah. I'd like to see many people accept white supremacy as real and relevant. We have a long Which road. Many politicians do not. That is the truth. And I think it's become easier to dehumanize people than to, um, like you were talking about respect and to acknowledge a story and acknowledge a journey rather than give to recognize the humanity in each person that you come across. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a lot of polarization around um, all kinds of issues. And because of that, it does make it a little bit easier for some of the people who are doing the dehumanizing um, to continue that process. And I don't think that's something always that we can teach, right? There's gonna be people who we're not gonna change their minds. So for me, instead, it's about how do I care for the people and advocate for the people who um, need me to raise my voice. Um, just one quick story. When I read White Fragility, if anybody's read that, one of the things she talks about in there is that women needed men to pass the right to vote, right? Women couldn't vote for themselves to be able to vote because they couldn't vote. And I think about that a lot. And so when I look at some of these images, I think about their voices and stories. And so what is my role in making sure that those stories are heard and, and honored and um, humanized? Um, at the same level that I would be able to be in the world. Yeah, that's, that's great. I think for a long time, we have certainly been comfortable with the reality of immigration among us. Uh, and if you go to places in Western Oklahoma, where it's uh, been a reality for generations, um, and there's, a, you know, so you, you can't drive through a place like Clinton or Woodward or Guymon without noting that that is completely different than it was 35 years ago in every way. And, uh, and it's now integrated and woven into the reality of immigration from the South is woven into the fabric of what we do every day. Um, so the fact that it, that it has happened is something that for the most part isn't acknowledged or understood, well, it's not acknowledged as a reality for most people in, in the society. And I think the first understanding is that, that it's real, it's among us, and it's changed all kinds of things. And that underneath that, because for the most part, it uh, has, been, uh, has been illegal, that at the basis of it is a, a level of violence that, we're, that we've been pretty much perfectly content to live with. And uh, it's the price of doing business in our society. And I think once we become aware of, of the price and those who pay it, I think that's the beginning of, of, of coming to understand what immigration reform has to be legally. Yeah. And I do think that we tend to think of only one thing when people say immigrant, right? We t I think as a, a U.S. society, we tend to think of the immigrants or the people who are seeking asylum um, who somehow are less than, um, but they deserve the same attention that some of the other people who came here as asylum seekers from countries that we might not, you know, if you're... I don't even know if we have any Irish immigrants these days, but you know, if you came from Ireland with the same needs as another population, you're seen differently. And so I think it's time for us to challenge that lens that people are looking through and well, to acknowledge. It, it depends on when you came from Ireland. Well, that... <laughs> 150 years ago, nobody was gentle to the Irish. <laughs> yes. But I think that sometimes our own biases, I mean, definitely our own biases get in the way about whether one human's deserving and another one is not. Okay. When, when in fact that's not true. Yeah, yeah and, and that's a great point um, because our immigration law has actually, the history has been reflected of, reflective of what group we don't like, we um, people in power are afraid of in a given time and that you can track the history of our immigration policy and it tracks with what group we were labeling the other and afraid of at a given time. Not we here, but right. 
you know, lawmakers. Societal means. Right. 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 From the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, then now against brown Americans. Right. Or brown Central Americans. So. Chad, were you able to hear that question? Yes. I've been trying to listen in. It's a little echoey for me, but I think that one of the things that we need to get away from in this country is the idea of fixed borders. And we've had a president now for four years who's going to make this feel better. And we're all in the Americas. We're all citizens of the Americas. These folks wanted to migrate here because why? Because they're oppressed in their country. Why were they oppressed in their country? A lot of it had to do with policies that we have in this country uh, that are not democratic when it comes to dealing with other countries. So we helped create the situation and then we're upset that these people want to come here. It's a, a little catch-22. And it's always about the other. You know, we always have some other group be an enemy. And the fact of the matter is, we're all the worst enemies in this country. And until we understand that and get away from this garbage, we're going to have these horrific problems. Um, I'll just add quickly that from my humble perspective, I don't have a background in political science. I <laughs> have my master's degree in fine art, so take it. <clears throat> for what it's worth, but um, what it seems to me is yes to all of this, but also um, investing in public education so that children from an early age understand what critical thinking is and understand how to question uh, things and think for themselves and come up with their own perspectives on things um, and a value shift just generally, uh, our values are upside down um, often, uh, and I, it seems to me like a just a, a, a shift in value, and that can come from learn more people understanding critical thinking exercises and um, understanding the difference, for example, between empathy and sympathy, and things like this um, sort of add up to change a culture, um, and that's from my perspective, for what it's worth. <laughs> Did you have a question? Yeah. Yes. Um, I had a question for any of the panelists who have like, the background in photojournalism. Um, I know that recently there's been some criticism leveled against documentary photography, um, especially photographs like the Afghan girl and how um, Photographers, when they point their lens at someone in a situation of violence or poverty, um, you know, it can become kind of an exploitive relationship. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, you know, how you uh, specifically speak to that criticism, how you respond to it, um, how do you um, see yourself as part of the solution? Or, um, well, it's very important. Like I don't, I don't go and just. I noticed and I've seen and I don't like photojournalists that just go with a tele lens, take that picture far away, don't even ask the name, don't even interact, don't even have this humane interaction. That for me it's garbage. You have to have this connection with the people that you're that you're photographing. Whoever it is. You do a wedding, you have an interaction with your, the wife, with the bride. You have, you, you have to have this interaction. It, it's beautiful, it's, it's real, it's, it's a, there's a connection. And you have permission. You know, if the person gives you permission, it's very important that the person gives you permission, especially if they are an asylum seeker, because they may not want their picture to be all over the place. Or may or or they may they may want it, but it's their decision, and you have to give them that right. That if you're gonna snap the picture, you have to have a conversation with them and ask permission. You know, so it's how you do it that is very important in the intention of of it. Chad, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Did you need me to repeat the question? Yes, if you don't mind. 
Um, correct me if I'm paraphrasing this, Brock. Um, but um, what uh, I guess, what's your take on exploitation in photojournalism, and how do you avoid it, or how do you, how does one avoid exploiting those that they're photographing in photojournalism? Is that about right? Oh. Exploitation in photojournalism is just like exploitation in the media. It's unethical, and it's not what you're supposed to be doing. There's supposed to be a sense of objectivity when you're doing any type of reporting, be it with words or with images. And uh, when I worked as a photojournalist, I had to get the names of the people I was photographing to make sure that they were okay with me taking the photographs. And uh, that's similar to what somebody does when they're working as a professional photographer or doing an exhibit. They have to have permission of those people that they're photographing. So, Exploitation really has no room in, in, in the ethics of journalism. It just, it just doesn't. And I'm not a photojournalist background, but I would say that so many of the critical issues, right? I love that you said this, that I need to know the story because I think we have a couple issues beyond exploitation. If I don't tell the story with this picture, what will people not know? And how do I... Um, increase some advocacy and awareness because of the picture I could take. But at the same time, how do I protect the person who's going to see it? Um, how do I decrease maybe any traumas that I might reveal for them because of the picture that I'm putting out there? So I think for me, there's some kind of balance about how do I um, capture the story, capture the image, tell the story to the world, um, and call people to act right, with their brain in their heart, like you had said, Ada. Um, but also, how do I make sure that I'm really taking care of the people who I want to see this as well. Because I know that in this day and age and all of the social media, um, all of the doom scrolling that everybody's doing, in some ways you can become desensitive, desensitized mm -hmm. to what you're seeing and then not act at all. So if your mission is a call to action, making sure there's that balance so that you'll continue to get people to, to kind of take something and do something from what you presented to them. No. And Julia, since we're, oh, I'm sorry. No, I, I just want to say that that uh, all of us want to be on the side of the angels when it comes to our encounter and our ability to communicate uh, our encounter, especially in situations where people are exploited and uh, where we, in fact, want to help. That doesn't mean we are, we are angels. And I think journalists bear a particular responsibility that uh, not only can they uh, exploit the people that, whose uh, pictures they take or the stories that they tell, they can also be exploited by the pictures they take and the stories that they yeah. tell, woven into a narrative that's larger than them. So that uh, all of us have to work especially hard to, um, um, to evaluate and to, to think through the stories that come to us. And uh, I think that there have been um, uh, so many times, especially lately, where uh, the, the question of the integrity of journalism has, uh, has been rightfully, um, uh, has entered into a rightful kind of dialogue where sincerity isn't enough. And because we're all part of a larger story that we're uh, participating in. So whether we point a camera and shoot and say, this is the story, or whether we say, this is, this is the, the face of a particular person who's be, who has been caught up in this larger story of which I am a part, of which mm -hmm. you're a part. Mm -hmm. And all of us have our place in that. And all of us rightfully deserve to, to question and to respond to where our place in that story is. So uh, I, I think we have, I grew up with the expectation that real artists stood above the situation where they, where they were, uh, in which they participated, and they, they, they told us a story that, that communicated the truth of that situation. And I never thought of an artist as being engaged in the story and, and in the telling of the story, promoting the story as the story they were telling, rather than simply um, giving us a dispassionate view of life as it is. And uh, so let's not mistake being on the side of the angels with being angels. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, well, since we're uh, 
talking about the side of the angels. <laughs> um, Julia, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about your takeaway sure. from Ada's photographs and um, from your perspective and your expertise. Um, I want you talk to talk about, about trauma parenting. Yeah. <laughs> trauma parenting, yes. Um, my youngest is 18, so I've been through my trauma parenting already right now. <laughs> Yeah, I have good kids. It wasn't that. It wasn't that bad. Um, for me, I just wanted to say a little bit about me personally and my own. I'm sitting up here as a woman who is a you know a white woman with a lot of privilege that I didn't really understand the concept of white privilege probably until I was uh, further along in my adulthood than I should have been. Um, you know, I spent time a military brat. I moved a lot, and when I would move, I was always welcomed into these other military communities with my parents, and there were other people that would embrace us, and sometimes we were only there with one suitcase because the rest was on the way. It wasn't because I had to pack that up quickly and that was all that I had. And so one of my first professional jobs, it's just really fun to sit here and be flanked by um, two people from Catholic Charities, was at Catholic Charities. And really it was through that probably development of my professional life where my um, capacity to know these other stories, despite how many places I traveled, um, to know these individuals who came from circumstances that I could hardly even imagine um, and still have resilience and hope and so that was really a big lesson for me about my role in the story, that how then can I help ensure that that dream is fulfilled, that that, that, that journey, that that challenge that they faced um, had meaning and purpose and my part in it. The other thing that I think a lot about with immigration before I get to the trauma side is that um, I really love to travel and I really love to go to other countries and try their food and talk to people and go to all the places the tourists won't go, right? I want to go and I want to sit on the porch of a family um, and have a conversation. And whenever I come back, I always feel like a whole different person and I feel like I've grown. And so it's kind of always surprising to me about people's concepts of immigration because I am enriched every time I encounter a person that's not like me. And it just befuddles me that we turn away <laughs> um, this, this possibility to make a much more uh, rich fabric um, for our countries and our communities. So anyway, so that's kind of my own personal, where I come from and why I really believe in some of these things. But related to trauma, I think um, one thing I'm really thankful that UCO, that we call it Dreamer Ally Program, that you can come to later on this week, because I think that's just that term really um, embraces, I think, what UCO is trying to ensure that our students and our community has. But people who have been on such journeys and jumped on trains and lost their leg, uh, people who witness that, people who see witness and big, right, whether in person or whether you're watching it um, through a media perspective, we can be impacted by that trauma. And so some of the signs and symptoms, I think, to be, and this is kind of good timing, right, because there's a lot of us have been, um, well, everybody's been living in the pandemic, but trauma can show up in so many different ways. It can show up in the way that you think, you know, in my, your memory, your sleep. Um, it can show up in your irritability. It can show up in your focus. Um, it can, we can kind of our, who we stay, hang around with, um, who we, are we isolating ourselves? And so for me, what, when people who have had these traumatic experiences, doing some check-ins around those things and making sure that they have what they need to continue to thrive. But the biggest concept for me is around trauma-informed care. And so that the assumption of trauma-informed care is that every person you meet, you treat them as if they've had a trauma because then everybody will get the best of it all. You know, ensuring safety, ensuring collaboration, ensuring empowerment, um, and asking the question instead of, why are you acting that way? Why are you dressed that way? Why do you smell that way? Um, any of those things that sometimes people encounter, if somebody's been on a journey for weeks and weeks and weeks on a train, what has happened? that you smell that way, look that way, talk that way, um, act that way. And what can I do to help you to, to smell and act and feel and be the way you want to be? And so, but usually our first reaction is, you know, from a parent, if we're going to talk about trauma parenting, um, you know, your kid slams the door and you say, why are you slamming the door? Instead of, gosh, what happened today that you slammed the door? So when I look at all of these faces of um, all of these people, and I really, when you said the only person crying, because that was one of the things I was struck by. Every picture that you look, you can almost feel some of the story. Um, but things have happened that caused some other things. And so making sure that we're asking those questions. And then the other thing that I would say is around every person you encounter, whether when we're assuming that they've had a trauma, is what can you do that instills hope? Because hope is really the driver for carrying on. 
you know, that we, that makes people not give up. Um, that makes people take the next step and do the next thing. And even if that's around advocacy, I think sometimes we lose hope um, with different kinds of, whether that's legislative advocacy or policy advocacy in your own organization, when we kind of aren't, I hate to say getting our way, but when things don't seem to be going our way, we start to lose hope and we give up. And the only thing I know for certain is that when you stop being an advocate, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. And so instead to continue to do things, um, and to see the hope that could happen because of your efforts, um, because it does have an impact and, um, increases that it changes. If we get more people who are on the side of advocacy, it can change a whole community. So that was kind of my bit. Great. Does anyone uh, have any questions about trauma or trauma recovery? Okay, well, if they come up at any point, just raise your hand or shout them out. Um, Chad Perry. Uh, we have some slides. Yeah, I'm prepared just to come for comments, and I thought I'd read those and then take questions if that's okay. Great. I want to thank Veronica for inviting me to be a part of this panel discussion. I also want to thank Anna for providing us with such fine work to discuss here today. It's an honor for me to be considered as a part of this panel, and I hope I can do some small justice with the work and aesthetic that Anna has given us all. First, I want to discuss of the role of a participant observer. The participant observer is a method of conducting qualitative research and communication in other social sciences. I use this method in my three-year study of an English and the second language program in New Mexico. The students consisted of working class Mexican and Central American immigrants, and many of them wanted to enhance their English skills so that they could help their children with their homework. I imagine many of the subjects of Otis photos had similar goals in their attempted trek to the United States. When working in the role of participant observer, it's very important to participate in the environment without interfering with the environment. Your goal is to tell the story of those you're observing and not your story. I realize that I've been in this role before when I've worked as a photojournalist. When you're on assignment, your task is to capture information data, if you will, about those you're observing without interfering with their story. So it's storytelling without the story being about you as the observer. Ada does that, just that in her observations. We're given this powerful story about this Caribbean of citizens of the Americas. She gives us story after story in her photos of pain, despair, and hope. We know as citizens of the United States that our government was and is involved in denying their story of being oppressed with a false narrative of how they're coming to oppress the people of the United States. And Otta tells these stories of the beauty of black and white photography. Otta's pictures are disturbing, and the total range of black and white photography enhances just how disturbing the subject matter is. It is also important how one can paint with light when using this medium. Ada is very aware of this and how to use light or the darkness to frame the story. Ada is also very aware that beauty sometimes has to have the courage to be cold. Ada follows the fine tradition of black and white photography. Yes, this is documentary photography, and yes, it is a fine example of photojournalism. Photojournalists must tell the story without getting in the way. Being a participant observer that tells the subject story about one's own. The tradition of the black and white medium lends an authenticity and a starkness to the story that would be lost if these images were color. For it also sparks to, uh, speaks to the notion that many untrained people have about art. Art to them has to be a pretty picture, something that can only be euphoric or romantic. The beauty of fine art is not about a pretty picture, but a sense of truth that can be beautiful because it confronts us and disturbs us. Otto's work also provides us with the counter narrative to the dominant narrative skewed by Donald Trump. Trumpism is not new. 
It has just been repackaged as an ongoing racist batch of nativism that go, that go back to where you came from garbage associated with centuries-old white privilege in the United States. The truth of the story quite often is in a calendar. The story that is oppressed by the dominant race, the story that comes from the oppressed, or what is referred to as the other, the alien, the group that does not look like the dominant group and that the dominant group fears. In my studies, I found that the true story usually resides in the calendar. Facts, not alternative facts. Or as President Barack Obama recently said, this isn't reality television. This is reality. The history of nativism in this country is a long story. Now terrorists are people of color again. For a long time, it was whatever tribe needed elimination for the onslaught of white, white settlers. And then it shifted to the latest European immigrants. Irish were drafted into the Civil War as soon as they came off the ship. German immigrants, known as the enemy aliens, were interned in camps during World War I, and German Americans were interned again during World War II. Italian nationals were also detained during World War II. And I would argue that Japanese Americans in camps during World War II started the current trend of blaming people of color for our woes. The fear of terrorism of the other has been a long-standing fear in the U.S. Other than the acts of 9-11, the acts of terrorism in the U.S. have been homegrown and done by white people. Oklahoma has witnessed three horrific acts in its history. The land grab in the 1800s, the Tulsa Massacre of 1921, and the Oklahoma City bombing of 1995. All were by white people, by citizens of the U.S. Trumpism is not new. It is not about freedom of speech, but freedom of racist views. It is about the white privilege that has been in this country since the slave owners drafted the Constitution. We have never been the shining city on the hill. That is part of the propaganda of the dominant narrative perpetuated for centuries by the white race in the United States. Odd is part of that fine tradition that questions that false narrative with a counter-narrative that we cannot deny. Let me put this in context for those of us in Oklahoma. Besides horrific acts of terrorism in Oklahoma, there's a history of migration from Oklahoma seeking a better life, just as the subjects of honest photos are attempting to do. It happened during the Great Depression, and we can turn to art once again to best depict what it was like. John Steinbeck made the subject of his great novel, The Great Debrat. His novel is about a family, the Joes, leaving Oklahoma seeking work in California. The story tells us of the prejudice they were subjected, subjected to for being Okies, a derogatory term in its inception. Let that sink in for a minute. Just because of where you were from, make you less. If you were from Oklahoma, you were the other, a plague, something less than human. The horror of the Great Depression was also captured by Dorothy Lay, another great documentary photographer. She was part of the WPA during the Great Depression and captured numerous beautiful and disturbing photos of the counter-narrative of the truth. I can't help but think of Lay when I view these photos taken by Ada. The pain continues. When will we be the shining city? Otta's work exposes us to the naked truth that the U.S. government is involved in another act of terror, one that has gone on throughout the Trump administration and was ongoing before he creeped into the national site and spewed his violent rhetoric. In some of Otta's photos, there are subjects staring into the lens. One could argue that Otta is paying attention to herself because the subjects are aware that she is there, but that gaze is most appropriate in these pieces because that gaze is not meant for Ada, but for us here, now, in the United States. When are we going to end the terror? Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions or comments for Chad that includes the panel? Uh, questions from considering a lot is what do you think it will take to 
tackle white supremacy in the United States and throughout the world? So the question is, what do you think it will take to tackle white supremacy in the United States and throughout the world? Is that correct? Yes. Oh. I think a I lot think of people are following it. <laughs> white race being aware of their whiteness. That's step and one. That understanding that, that it's all fiction. That it's reality television and not reality. Ada, did you have something you wanted to say? I think two things. Um, very simple. Um, the loss of fear, because um, it's fear that fuels hate. Mm -hmm. um, and more love. Those two things. And I think in many ways it's about a collective voice that when you talk about that fear, I think some people are afraid of advocating for the right thing. Um, and we think it's somebody else's job to do that. I know at UCO we do a lot of um, active bystander training where we try to teach students to, to step up and um, you know either delegate the responsibility or um, to do something, right? Not just to sit idly by, but I think that sometimes it's so hard to act and you think you're alone. But my hunch is once we recognize that collectively we can make an impact, you just have to figure out who those allies are. Um, it will seem like that effort is stronger than what we might feel like we're up against. Yeah, and again, I mean, I'll stop disqualifying myself eventually, but um, <laughs> from my perspective, it seems like deprogramming needs to happen. Almost like when someone leaves a cult, they need to go through a deprogramming phase. Um, and that's part education and make having better access to education, which is my answer to almost everything, but also um, cultural, it's a cultural shift. They, we need to just deprogram uh, white supremacy out of us because I don't think it's inherent, it's a taught thing, um, so. And I think the way we're communicating sometimes right now, and this is just for my, my clinician hat, um, we tend to say I'm either in this camp or I'm in this camp. And I, I'm not saying that I want a group to become more like white supremacist, but I think that the way we communicate, um, I think there are people in the middle who aren't choosing camps, right? Who, but the way that we're polarizing, the way that we're dehumanizing each other from either side sometimes makes it hard to make any progress at all. And We've got to figure out a better way to have some civil discourse so people don't think that it's um, a bad thing to do the right thing. Yeah. What do y'all think? Do you have a question? I, I guess um, my question is uh, how do we facilitate a life basketball discourse? And a lot of a lot of people, I guess, the the white supremacist camp. I mean, it was only I think last week that we saw a lot of them storming the Capitol. How do we facilitate civil discourse um, with people who are committed to the opposite of civil discourse? Yeah. What I've witnessed a lot in this last week is that we're instead of doing, we're expressing a lot of the anger that we have towards it. And that's what we're doing. And so the people who, the insurrectionists at the Capitol, those aren't the people that you're gonna get to be strong advocates for marginalized people. But then what I hear students saying, what just on this campus when I'm interacting with students over some of these issues is, um, all of those people who are for Trump, Right, that's one statement I've heard. But all of those people who might have voted that way were not necessarily the insurrectionist. And so what do we need to do to have some conversations um, to help people experience it differently. And I think exhibits like this help raise the conversation because it's not me, you know, the hard conversations when you're able to say, I think you think this way. But instead when you have an exhibit like this or you have um, something maybe that you even see 
that you've read about or heard about and say, what, tell me more about what you think about this. Um, let's have a conversation and see where we both meet in the middle. And there's groups out there that, I mean, there's some podcasts right now that the two people who are opposite sides, they go and research the issues and come back and discuss what did they find in their research that they have in common. Because you're not people who are, let's pick food stamps or SNAP benefits. There's not people who are anti people having the food that they need to eat. Most people are for food security. Then how do we join our forces about that to make progress? Right? And I think that's what's missing. Instead, we're saying, you don't believe what I do and you don't believe what I do, so we're going to stay in our camps. And I'm just going to let anger be what I do. But I think we have to pause for a minute and say, what do we both believe that will move us forward? That one is called Pantsuit Politics. <laughs> It's highly intellectual. <laughs> and just to jump on that really quickly, um, it, I do think art has that superpower, in, in my opinion. But of course, I have a pretty biased opinion about art. But um, I think it will, if we enlarge it to movies and television, uh, food, poetry, the, poetry mm -hmm. this is the great, it's always been the great unifier. Um, and sometimes it's bad because sometimes it, it makes a pretty package over the ugliness and then we just put it over there, we don't talk about it. Um, but sometimes it, uh, sometimes to have a, I know I've had very difficult conversations with family members, right, where I know that if I approach it head on, it's not gonna go anywhere. But if I remove myself a little bit from the equation and almost like have a filter there, then I can get make more progress uh, with that person. And sometimes art is that barrier, uh, the pretty barrier that helps you make progress with the with having those difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. Does that make did I make sense? Well, no. I think it's important also to know that we don't otherize all those other people and presume that I'm in possession of the answer. Mm -hmm. because I can disagree with what other people do. They have part of the answer here. And all those people who did that are out there, and uh, all those people who agree with me are over here. And every single one of those people is an individual who has his story or, or her experience, and, and each one of them is part of this dialogue that we have to be a part of. And so uh, uh, the categories that we throw around pretty cavalierly are uh, just as manipulative and just as otherizing because we use them uh, as if they were used by somebody else. And so let's just remember that uh, we're in search of an answer together. And as a political reality, uh, you know, unfortunately, it tends to, to become binary. It's either this or that. We're voting for this person, not that person, or for this policy that turns into, you know, yay or nay. But when we're looking for how to live together, uh, I think it's important to acknowledge that uh, my experience is not the unitary experience, that my understanding isn't the sole understanding, and that my body of experience and my capacity to understand other people's experience isn't the sole measure of life and how and, and, and understanding. So, you know, the, the, the invitation for art to, to cross the boundaries of, of my experience and invite me into another level of experience is, is why that's so important. Uh, unfortunately, I think that, that we uh, tend to step back from the, from the picture and uh, G.K. Chesterton said that the most important part of a, of a picture is its frame <laughs> because we know where the picture ends, right? We know where the, where, where the art is supposed to be directed. But we also uh, remove ourselves from the experience that we're invited into. And we're always standing as the objective observer. So we can walk out of here presuming I've encountered another, another level of experience that, that I wasn't aware of and feel pretty good about that. And then presume that the sum of my experience along with all the other experiences that I've had 
places me in a position that I don't have to listen to other people or I can discount their experience or I can make that opinion into something minor or less than it is, I can, I can separate myself from all those other people. So uh. it's a continual invitation that, that uh, you know, we, we live our lives until we don't live them anymore. And that means that we continually encounter what we don't know, what we're challenged to find, and what, what we need to survive. And I think that when we stop doing that, we become this dead weight uh, that, that becomes either this or that. It's either one thing or the other. That's a really good point. But, and you know, again, I mean, I have the job of bringing things together. Right. <laughs> and, and so. I'm really uh, glad you're here. It's, well, it's, it's uh, and you know, I live in a parish. You know, I, I have a thousand Anglo families, whatever that means, you know, a thousand Anglo family means they're not Mexican, right? So then I have a thousand Mexican families, whatever that means. Um, and, you know, bringing them together is, you know, to find ways for them to see each other as the people that they are and not as categories or colors or languages or the kind of food they like or the kind of music they listen to. Yeah. And one of the ways we do that is person first kind of language. So instead of saying those people, you know, maybe it's people who enjoy eating all different kinds of foods instead of those people that eat junk food. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the more that we see people as people, you can't choose who you want. You can't say, I'm not going to dehumanize, um, a Siles. I'm only going to dehumanize this group. I mean, that whole idea of what is it that then brings us together? Yeah. I, I, I don't know if you've had this chance to see the movie News of the World, mm -hmm. but it's the first Western I've ever seen <laughs> that actually tries to wrestle with the fact that wandering around on the frontier, people had a really tough time trying to understand each other because all kinds of languages were spoken. So the main character finally coming out of the desert by himself runs into a wagon train in North Texas but it's no big help because they all speak German and he only <laughs> speaks English. Right? Well, he speaks a few words of German because he grew up in a multicultural city, San Antonio, where most of the people who didn't speak English that, they, that the English people hung around spoke German. Okay. Well, we get this experience on film that at least prized the can open of our own personal family stories that we, for the most part, never pay attention to it because it's never presented in art. I mean, everybody watches the Westerns and we get these stories. Everybody talk, people might talk with accents, but they all talk English. Mm -hmm. In News of the World, half the characters aren't speaking English at all. <laughs> well, a pretty good description of my grandparents. Right. And it doesn't um, treat the viewer like they can't, they can't read subtitles like it, you know, oh, we couldn't possibly ask this of the viewer to, you know, read a subtitle or, you know. Well, and then the main, again, I just, I love the story. Uh, you have a, a German girl. Uh, she's not born in the United States. Uh, let me show you. born in the United States of German parents in a, in a, killed by, the parents are killed by the Kiowa who take her off and kidnap her, who then are killed by settlers. So she's an orphan twice over, can't remember the German she grew up with, speaks only Kyle, and wants to go back to the tribe where she was raised. So she doesn't know where she belongs and is escorted by a Confederate captain who's had to invest his life in the Confederacy, then surrender to the Union in a state that went out with the Confederacy is desperately poor and everybody hates the politicians in Washington. Nobody knows what they're supposed to do. Nobody knows how to communicate, how to cross the barrier between different groups of people. And nobody knows what they're supposed to be doing. It's a terrific story, actually. <laughs> Maybe we'll have a movie night. We'll screen it here. Well, I would recommend it. Well, and I think back to the one picture you had of the young man you said ended up in the orphanage, kind of relating to what you're talking about. So he was maybe started off in a family that was kind of okay, but something went wrong with those parents, or maybe historically 
parents didn't get what they needed, so then they don't parent this child right, and then they abandon him. So then this kid has this opportunity to either join the gangs or jump on these trains and get in with these groups and ends up in an orphanage. I mean, there's like 18 pathways where this kid could have ended up. And what Ada seemed to have was this compassionate time with him and saw his value and worth, right? And now he's ended up in a safe place. But you could have, if he'd gone another way, encountered him with a weapon where he was not somebody that most people would look at as an upstanding citizen. And so everybody has a story that might be one step away from something different. And I really believe that about people all across the spectrum. And sometimes it's that puzzle of figuring how, where is the connection point? Sure. Uh, a friend of mine that I was in school with um, grew up in South San Diego. His father was from Italy. His mother was from Sonora. Um, so he was traveling in Iowa in 1980, which the, this wave of immigration had just begun up into Iowa. And a, two young guys from Mexico had rid, ridden up on the train, and one of them had gotten sick and ended up in the hospital. No one could speak Spanish, so doctors and nurses would, you know, to do what they, would try to do what they could. He and he had a urinary tract infection. They wanted him to give them a urine sample, and so they would walk in with dictionaries and try to try to communicate. So, my friend Peter walks in. He's from South San Diego. Looks pretty Mexican. So he said, "Do you speak Spanish?" And he said, "Sure." So he walked in. They said, well, tell him we, we need to get a urine sample. So Peter walks in, closes the door, and the guy said, uh, you know, brief introduction. So he said, hey, is this a okay place? And he said, well, yeah, I guess so. He said, well, are the, are the people here, are they okay? And Peter said, well, I guess so. What do you mean? And he said, huh, I got all these people who come in here and want to use my bathroom. So, <laughs> translation is really hard. And uh, again, when I see these pictures, that, that you know that question, what does this mean? You know, and, and and not just what does it mean inside of this image, there in that place, but but what does it mean translated into the life I live, and the experience that I have, and the um, the narrative universe. That forms me, and 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 what am I to say? How am I to um, uh, place that inside of the world that I know and the way that I can understand? And so, uh, you know, so we're all performing translation every day. Sometimes we're really good at it, and sometimes we're. I mean, we don't know. We don't, we have no idea what to say or do. Mm -hmm. But there's one thing, if you're translating, there's one thing you know, and that is, you know when you don't understand. Yeah. Well, I was going to actually ask you next what your takeaway from the work was. Well, okay. <laughs> I have, uh, uh, I was uh, at a family reunion up in Okarchi. My mother comes from there. And uh, my mother grew up speaking German. She didn't speak any English until she was about 10. And she still spoke with a kind of accent. There were a, a couple of words she couldn't say in English, although she was born in Oklahoma. Um, and so uh, we, I was standing in the church in Okarchi, and they asked me about where I was in Duncan. Uh, I was pastor in Duncan uh, in you know, the, the whole county, several counties there. And about 80% of the church was Spanish speaking. And so my uncles, who'd hardly ever been out of Canadian County said, yeah, the Mexicans are nice people. They just don't want to learn English. We were standing in a church with the stained glass windows. Underneath each one, it said, gewidmet von dem Altarverein, you know, donated by the altar society. Okay, a church where they grew up, their first language wasn't English, 60 years after their ancestors got there, they, they never connected that, that story, the story of those people in Duncan and the people that they knew who were up from Mexico, didn't have anything to do with their story. Right? They, they never connected those two. In my experience, growing up in a family like that, where my aunts 
would say if, if somebody from Okarchi, one of those families, married somebody whose last name was like Smith or Jones, they would say he married an American. He didn't marry somebody like us. So they, they never connected. But in fact, you know, the, the experience of virtually uh, well, I, most of the families I know uh, is a story of immigration, a story that's generally been suppressed and or translated into uh, a story of ultimate success. And so the stories of the trauma, the uncertainty, the difficulty, the poverty uh, erased so that nobody learns that part of their own story. And so to encounter these images um, is the invitation to begin to, um, to, is the invitation to deepen the, the, the first question, which is, look, these aren't categories, these are people. And these experiences are real experiences of crossing, in, of crossing the border and seeking a new kind of life. And, uh, and all of the difficulties that, that the desire for a new place and a new meaning uh, brings with it. And, and that's the story of the ancestors who came here in whatever the circumstances, whatever the circumstances were. But for the most part, you know, they, they came, I mean, who would come from the place where you belong to a place where you don't belong, which was you know, double or triple timed. You know, if you were Irish in the 1830s, <laughs> You came from a place where you couldn't live. You were oppressed by people who hated you. And you came to a place where everyone hated you. So, um, the, so to find in this the, the invitation to translate these images based on the language and the experience that's actually in your own story that can be as hidden or as removed as... Uh, the, the frames on the pictures. And that is empathy, right? I mean, accessing something in yourself to connect with something outside of yourself, mm -hmm. no? Mm -hmm. Right. So in your opinion, um, how do we move forward? What's the path? Well, I, mean, I think, first of all, to I invite kids to do this, to know your own story, I mean, first of all. And this is an invitation to, to ask, what happened when we crossed the border? Mm -hmm. That could have been 250 years ago, but maybe not that long ago. What happened when we crossed the border? The second thing is, um, there isn't a family in the world who hasn't experienced the measure of trauma that, that, that uh, gnaws at the, their, valid, their own self-validation and their own humanity. What happened? When we, in, in our story, my story, when those kinds of experiences took place, how were we, you know, dislocated, decentered, and uh, how did we descend into chaos, and what happened when we were there? And then the third thing I think is um, what does the community that we're actually a part of look like? Like, most of us. Think of it as oxygen. It, it's just there. And we, we have almost no interest in it or what it takes to sustain it in the way we've come, become used to. So, uh, so I, I think it's important to invite people into the kind of understanding of where this community comes from. So, and I'll end with this. All this talk about immigration is, is uh, it makes it sound like First of all, you know that it's, it's all happening right now. It's never happened before, but it happens in every single generation. But this whole question of what do we do was actually faced not that long ago. And that was that the people who had arrived here illegally were provided an opportunity to legalize their status, right? Because they had become woven into the community in such a way that you know to remove them would be well, we, we begin a detriment to the whole community. Okay, that wasn't the amnesty that took place in 1984. That was when all the Sooners got here and took the land illegally, 
And the Supreme Court decision basically said, because your US senators, US representatives, uh, regents at the University of Oklahoma, et cetera, et cetera, we can't just take all your land and throw you out because you got it illegally. We're just gonna say, since you're woven into the community, we're just gonna let things be. Okay. Um, so the story of where we come from, the story of you know, how we live here, and the story of what this is, I think invites us into the possibility of understanding in a way that crosses the boundary, I should say cross the distance between the pictures that we see and what we've come to know. That's great, thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Father Wolf? Anyone? Else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Comparing Obama's administration to Trump's administration in their policy towards immigration, what do you expect with Biden? Or do you expect anything with Trump? Well, you know, I, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, I know what's popular right now among certain segments of the, uh, you know, of the, of those who support Joe Biden, but. You know, I mean, the, the immigration system has been broken for generations. And so I, I personally don't have a whole lot of hope that it will be changed in, any, in a way significant enough to make much difference. That's my personal but political opinion. Because I just haven't seen it happen with, with administrations. Republican and Democrat, as far as I'm concerned, are pretty much expressive of the majority opinion of people in the United States, which is, you know, we got to keep these people out. I think Clinton era legislation is really reflective of that. I mean, Clinton was a Democrat. Um, he, he passed them really, some of the law is good, but also a lot of it is very problematic and restrictive of immigration. And so I don't think we should be naive in assuming that everything is going to change with the Biden administration. Yeah, we change. We can change policy by voicing our opinion. And I think sometimes I'm reminded of one story. I think sometimes when you talk about stories and how powerful they are, when I worked at Catholic Charities, we had somebody who had come from a, a war-torn nation, um, not from the Central Americas, but he had, um, in his other life, a master's in engineering. And when people come here as refugees, they don't ever land those jobs when they come as refugees. So he was working as a janitor in a Brahms. That's the job he got. And um, one of the members of the Brahm family was there and just started talking to him. and discovered this story and became an advocate for more opportunities for work that people had had in the country that they came from instead of just putting them into positions so that they'd have a job. And so I think when you can, you might find advocates in the funniest places, right? I bet two weeks before that, if you would have asked that person, would you help us be an advocate for asylum seekers and for immigrants? They would have said no. But then once you get a personal story sure. and you know that person's experience, you might not be advocating for the entire population of people, but you have enough energy to advocate for something to be different for that person. And so connecting those policymakers to the people that you know, for you to be able to go and tell your story. I mean, that's how change happens. But some of us think we're powerless to that. Mm -hmm. But you never know which moment is going to turn the corner for someone to make a decision change. Well, and, you know, politicians are uh, political animals. Uh, it, all it takes is, I mean, if, if it's a binary, if it's just this or just that, and it's 50.1% this and 49.9% that, to, to, uh, to be in a position where you can influence their decision making actually puts you in the driver's seat. Now, how that happens, of course, is up in the air, but we are not powerless when it comes to, they in fact are reflecting the majority opinion of the people in the United States. If we can change the majority opinion, all of the politics will change. It'll change overnight. Uh -huh. Now, 
No, no, that's not like a small job. But it's not like, <laughs> I'm sorry, you know, this is written in stone. Of course, it's not written in stone. Right. But I think it's finding, again, when we talk about that other side, finding where that connection point is. You know, I'm not related to this, but in one of my early childhood lives, we were all, I was a big advocate for early childhood development, right? And, and that was the talk that I talked. But when we shifted the conversation to this little baby's going to be your employee, they didn't want to hear about what was good for that baby's development. But when we shift it to, if you'll invest dollars in this baby, you'll have a good employee when they're 25. All of a sudden, the world changed in investment in childhood, early childhood development. So I think sometimes when you find that connection point, when the person in Brahms found that connection point, it shifts. And with enough shifts, it turns. That's a translation you were talking about. Yes. You spoke their language. Yeah. Um, well, Sarah, yeah. do you want to tell us a little bit about immigration? Sure. Mm -hmm. Happy to. So I like to start off with this quote just to get us thinking. Um, I mean, you'd be shocked. <laughs> Maybe you'd hear it too about the number of people who still use the word illegal to refer to like someone as an illegal. Mm -hmm. um, as a noun. Um, and so it's just, just to think about uh, our shared humanity. Um, human beings can be beautiful or more beautiful. They can be fat or skinny. They can be right or wrong. But illegal, how can a human being be illegal? And so as we go through and look at immigration law and policy, um, just want to still keep that in mind. So that's just a roadmap. Um, I'm going to go over real quick overview of um, the structure. How does one obtain status? Um, go over special, some special categories of immigrants and roadblocks for immigrating. So um, Congress passes laws, right? Um, and the president does have some executive authority to make policy, but. That, as we've seen with DACA, can be done away with, with the stroke of a pen in a subsequent administration. Um, immigration law is civil. It's not criminal law. So that makes the use of the term illegal even more <laughs> ironic <laughs> when you, when, and yeah. So <laughs> we'll get into that one. But it's ever changing and complex. So it's a hot topic right now. But it, even when it's not, and it's moments where it's not as front of mind for people, it is constantly changing. Um, Congress said, I won't get into the, re the rest, I talk about the quotas later, so we won't dive into that yet. So there are basically three, there should be four categories to, when you think about how it breaks down as far as how someone obtains legal status. Oftentimes you'll hear people say, well, why don't they just apply for citizenship? Or why don't they just get in line? For some people, there is no line that you can get in. Um, and citizenship is the ultimate goal. There is a long path that people, if they do have a path, have to go through to get there. And it kind of breaks down like this, family-based immigration through an employer or through some sort of humanitarian type visa or in deportation proceedings. Uh-oh, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> That's okay, that was employment-based immigration and um, student visas. Let me make so it better. Most of the folks that we're talking about today are that are impacted by the Trump administration. Well, I won't say that he didn't have any negative effects on employment-based visas, but most of the people we deal with are not going to be sponsored by an employer. Immigration law respectfully refers to most of the employment visas breaks it down between skilled labor and unskilled labor. There are very few options for quote unquote unskilled labor. Um, most of the visa, there, there are H2B visas for um, migrant workers uh, in agriculture and other fields, but most of the people um, impacted that we're talking about today are not gonna be eligible for those types of visas, right? There's that binary problem again. Yeah, right. Um, so 
some basics on refugee and asylum. So refugees are, the definition is, they are identified as outside of the U.S. Um, so they apply for refugee status from, without, from outside of the U.S. They have to have a well-founded fear of persecution on account of a protected category, which is race, religion, national origin, um, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. That last category is where most people fit in, particular social group. Um, if they, when they're admitted, they come in as a refugee. Asylum, asylees, the legal requirements are the same. The only difference is, is that you apply at the border when you present yourself, or you are already here and you request asylum. It's just procedurally different. So talking about the Remain in Mexico policy that the people in these photos are heavily impacted by. So just for some background, um, prior to the Remain in Mexico policy was something that the Trump administration came up with. Before it, individuals who, and the law requires that individuals who are present themselves at the border for inspection be, and they express a fear of returning to their home country be given what's called a credible fear interview by an asylum officer. Within, and then if it's determined that they pass a credible fear interview, they're allowed entry into the country while they, while they await their court date, okay? Under this Remain in Mexico policy, asylum seekers who pass this credible fear, they've done all the right things, presented themselves at the border for inspection. They, have, they pass a credible fear interview instead of now being allowed to enter the United States, they're returned to Mexico. And, and these, they're not from people, these people are, most of them are from Central America, okay? Um, so they, there are no resources in Mexico. There are a ton of concerns with this. This is how I sort of broke them down when I think about them. First being due process concerns. It's incredibly difficult, if not impossible, for people to find counsel to represent them. Asylum cases are really complex and you, it's your chances of winning if you're representing yourself are very slim. So it limits people's ability to find counsel. Also, because there just aren't the lawyers available to work with people across the border, there are some nonprofits that are there, but there are very few, and there aren't enough resources to help the, all the people. Um, the other due process problem is you are in a place where you have no social ties, no community ties, no support. You can't contact your family member in Guatemala. You can't gather the documents that you need to present your case in front of the judge. Um, they're also, it's dangerous. Um, as we've already talked about, as um, Ada talk, you know, mentioned, was talking about earlier, these conditions are very dangerous along the border. Um, and, and you have to consider that people are coming here, most many of them, because they've, they're fleeing sexual violence, gang violence, um, and then our policies are putting them in a position where they're being subjected to the very same violence that they've fled and re-traumatized, being re-traumatized and murdered. I mean, there's just all sorts of terrible things. And I should say, um, it, the reason, I mean, there's no structure set up in Mexico for housing these, housing these people. Um, there, are, there are shelters, but there are not enough. And so people have set up makeshift camps along the border with, and then there's no security, you know, and then there's no sanitization. Little to no uh -huh. sanitization. Um, so the conditions are just, are very dangerous to people's health and physical safety as well. Um, and then the other obvious concern, as I mentioned before, it's not a legal program, okay? INA, and there's litigation around this, but it's still pending. It's being fought in the courts, um, and it's at the Supreme Court right now. But the INA, the Immigration Nationality Act, establishes procedures that require that the government provide asylum seekers with a credible fear interview, and then they, should, they have to be allowed entry into the country. And so this policy completely ignores that. And then there's also all the international law violations as well. Uh -huh. So um, 
So Biden has said that he's going to undo the Remain in Mexico policy, but these things are going to be, comp are, it's not going to happen overnight. It's complicated to unwind all the damage that's been done already. So it's not, there's not going to be a quick, I mean, compared to, it's not, it's a policy, it's not a regulation, so it'll be a little easier procedurally, but there are a lot, it's complex, complex and, and it's not going to be something that happens overnight. So um, just going along with the overview more, I don't know if people have questions about that in particular in the Remain in Mexico policy. No, okay. Um, there are other types of humanitarian visas that people might be eligible for. So when you think about the people that you're seeing in these photos, these are other things that they might be eligible for. Um, one is, well, not all of them are but eligible for these things, but some. We talked about the unaccompanied minors. So those, um, it's a legal definition. If, if you were, came to the United States not accompanied by a parent, um, and you're from a non-contiguous country, then you are given, you, you have unaccompanied minor status. If, you also have to be under 18. Um, SIGIS is short for Special Immigrant Juvenile Status. It's a remedy that many unaccompanied minors are eligible for. It's for people, kids who have been abused, abandoned, or neglected by one or both of their parents. So um, the, the young man who is in a shelter um, that you photographed could be eligible, was very likely eligible for this remedy if he could find a lawyer in the US to represent him, you know. But because of our policies, is, I understand he's still in, in I was, Mexico. No. Yeah, I was told that because he's uh, Honduran in Mexico and in the custody of Mexico, uh, he could not come to the United States because that if he was, that if I wanted to bring him here as uh, he was a Mexican, that I could but because he's from another country that I couldn't. Right, I mean, it, that's the Remain in Mexico policy at work. Okay. You know, um, I can't as a lawyer recommend that people come not at a point of entry, like enter at somewhere that's not a designated place where you're, that's an actual border crossing, because that's not lawful. But if that happens, someone like him could be eligible for this remedy, you know? Um, it doesn't matter how you came in, or whether you were inspected or not. Um, another option for people is the U visa. It's very, not, I don't want to say common. Um, unfortunately, because the people that we work with are impoverished, they're often in positions where they're getting, they're becoming victims of crime, right? And so this is a visa that is designed it's twofold. One, it, the purpose is twofold. One is to provide some protection for someone who's been victimized in this country. And the other is to help law enforcement do their job of protecting citizens. Um, and so often immigrants are afraid to report crimes to the police. And so that's one of the reasons that the U visa exists. So some common examples of the types of things that, it's not any type of crime, it has to be a crime against the person. So if your house is robbed and you're not home, you can't get a U visa for that. But um, some common examples are sexual assault, domestic violence, and felonious assault. So if you get, for, for example, robbed at gunpoint, that, that would be an example of that. And then there's DACA, um, which you've all heard of. The requirements for that, it's for kids, people who are brought here when they were under 16. They have to have entered before June 15th of 2007. They have to be in school or have graduated, okay? And it doesn't confer any lawful status. There's no path to citizenship right now with DACA. We had that, would have had that with the DREAM Act, but it did not pass. So, we're, there's talk that there's going to be legislation to do something similar to provide some path to citizenship for DACA folks, but we'll you know we'll see what happens. 
there. So I, I don't want to get into the weeds. I know and this is a little more in the weeds than this has generally been, but um, just know there are different, just because you have a family member who's a citizen doesn't mean you necessarily can immigrate through that person. There are certain family members who can petition for, for certain family members, okay? And even if you have a family, so even if, for example, your kid is a US citizen, depending on your immigration history, you may not ever be able to immigrate through them. Okay, so just, it, it's complicated. <laughs> Um, so apart from that, so these are just other roadblocks to emphasize how, how challenging it is and the legal obstacles for people to regularize their status, um, to get in a line, you know. Uh, so the quotas were mentioned on this previous slide. So with family immigration, if you're not, depending on the type of family relationship you have, you will you may be placed in a, a waiting line, essentially. Some of these wait lines are over 30 years long. So for many people, they will never be, under the current system, they'll never be allowed to immigrate, able to in, immigrate in their lifetime. So when we tell people get in line, <laughs> I'm in line, I've been in line for 25 years, you know. Um, I'm still waiting for a visa to be available. So the system truly is broken. This is one thing that really needs to be done away with, the quota system that only allots a certain quantity of visas for people depending on where, what country they're from and what visa category. So the cut, it, it, it doesn't just break down with the family relationship, it also is relevant what country you're from. So we've decided we only want X number of Mexicans every year. We only want X number of Indians every year. And it doesn't reflect the need, the push factors for people to come here, nor, nor does it reflect the pull factors, the reasons that people are coming here from certain countries. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's that. That's that, what I meant. That's the quota system again, so you can skip that. So I mentioned that a fourth way that someone can regularize their status is through um, some defenses to deportation. So this is not something we would ever recommend that people try to get themselves in deportation proceedings um, so that they can apply for some defense because that's a really risky strategy. But apart from the things I mentioned, so asylum, we talked about adjustment of status is family-based immigration for the most part. There's a defense for people who have been here for over 10 years who have a U.S. citizen or green card holder, parent, spouse, or child, that they could be eligible for something for cancellation called cancellation of removal. It's, there are a lot of other requirements, but that's the basic gist. Um, you know, a lot of people think that, oh, I want to help my neighbor. They've been here for, he's a good guy. He's been here for 20 years. I know him, he should be able to immigrate, right? And so, and or maybe he has family, kids who are citizens, what have you. There's no law that says that just because someone's been here for X number of years and is a good person and has family ties can immigrate necessarily. So, um, I mean, I, I think one of the things that I am for an amnesty program I think we clearly have a need for all this immigrant work. We take advantage we, when we go to the grocery store, we buy our fruit from California or wherever, and we take advantage of all the benefits that the immigrant community is providing us. And so it only makes sense that we would give people the opportunity to, I mean, to recognize them as full people and full humans and, and allow them to obtain legal status here. So I think that's all that I have. I don't know if there are any questions. I know, so like I said, a little in the weeds, but I was asked to present on like an overview of the immigration system, so. Is there a question on Instagram? Yes. One question is, if it is known that it is dangerous for asylum seekers and refugees to seek a safe place to live, 
Why is the process so complicated? And what is going to ha have to happen in order to fix the processes? So I think the Trump administration's asylum policies, and the Remain in Mexico one is, is only one. I think there are, and I'm not the only person who thinks this, they were clearly designed to limit the amount of people, restrict the amount of people to, who could obtain asylum and who could avail themselves of the process. I think, I forget who, but it was said by someone in the administration themselves that it was, it was designed as a deterrent to keep people from coming here. That's Stephen Miller. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I just want so, to add that my experience has been to make sure that you just get somebody to a place like Catholic Charities, right? Because it is so many nuances. And sometimes somebody I know, I've had times where people tell me a story and I'm like, oh, I just don't even, it seems like you should be able to get some legal remedy but and then for whatever i thought it was when they get the interview and they're like oh you now that we know these three things we actually might have something um, and so i think for me it's this big picture of i know somebody who's undocumented or somebody who needs support and staying just get them to somebody who can give them real legal advice um, and not lead them down astray into in trouble into trouble yeah mm -hmm. And Catholic Charities is really, really fantastic about that and honest. Thanks. I think sometimes yeah. they'll say to folks, I don't know a remedy. You might have to get in the 30-year line, um, but we'll keep trying, right? I mean, so I think sometimes people deserve that honesty, too. Well, yeah. They don't, they don't get that from every attorney. That's, That's yeah. I'm glad you I said mean, that. Yes. There, <laughs> I know people who have been paying attorneys for years and years, and, and you, they they have gone to Catholic charities and they said, well, there's no possible way that you have, that, that you can get into any line. And uh, the folk, they keep paying the attorney because they, well, maybe there's another chance we could do this or that or that. Uh, so anyways. Yeah. <sighs> That's, yeah. I did had to take a moment to process that information. Yep. Yeah. Do you have a question or a comment? Okay. Um, I was just gonna ask, um, from Charities, how like COVID impacted the immigration services that you're providing to people? So we're as busy as ever. <laughs> um, immigration cases take years to re to resolve themselves. So we've had an ongoing case list that we're still working on, and we have not slowed on at all with all new clients. We have gone mostly fully remotely, which has given us the opportunity to reach people in more rural areas. And that's something that we want to continue to offer after COVID, you know, that's the silver lining with, with COVID is that we're seeing different ways to provide legal services and access to justice to people in rural areas who otherwise would lack it. Um, but we are, you know, masking, <laughs> we have a rotating schedule so that there are fewer bodies in the office at a given time. Um, asking screening questions. So sometimes we do need clients to come into the office personally to sign things or do a declaration, interview them, because it's just a lot easier to connect, you know, thinking of counseling. I mean, you can do these things virtually, but it can be um, a lot easier to get people to tell you their story in person. So, yeah, but, but we have not slowed down. <laughs> Were there any other questions or comments for anyone on the panel? Um, another question would be, do you think the media helps or harms bringing awareness to issues regarding immigration? That might be a good one for you, Chad. Um, do you think the media hurt, harms or helps? Harms or helps bringing awareness to issues regarding immigration? bringing awareness to issues regarding immigration? I think it depends on um, what you're talking about. If you're talking about uh, Univision and uh, some Spanish-speaking media, I think they do a much better job of uh, providing a, a rounded story about immigration issues. But the mainstream is white stream, and the mainstream tells the white narrative. And that's the problem that we have in this country. We have to see the whole story instead of just part of it. 
audience. Ada, did you want to speak to that at all? I agree with him. Mm -hmm. I agree with, with that, uh, especially for instance, like when um, I was doing the caravan and I heard like Fox News and you know, what they were saying. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it was just lies. Like mm -hmm. they, they said that they, they were members, uh, like uh, people from the Middle East. That's not true. Mm -hmm. Like, like just plain lies. Uh, like, uh, like that. That's very hurtful. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I was. Well, oh, sorry. Well, and I, I, I would certainly keep in mind that the media is it is the media. It's it's not necessarily reflective of anything that is actually happening. And so there are 1,900 people sitting in prison in Hinton who are in prison because they are on their way to being deported. They are fit, they're, uh, doing out their prison time and then they'll be deported. And so that doesn't appear on anyone's radar screen for anything. Um, so, uh, you know, so if, if you scroll through the internet or look at, um, you know, some media report. These are invisible people. And so uh, we, we the, the, the media, especially television, especially video media, is designed to capture our attention. And if it doesn't, then we move on to the next thing that does capture our attention. So we should always remember, I think, that media tells us a story, not necessarily the story, and there's a thousand, thousand stories that it doesn't tell us at all. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say, I mean, it's a very powerful tool, right? It can do both, just like any powerful tool. It has the um, possibility of hurting, has the possibility of helping. Um, but we, the consumers, hold the power um, because we can choose to listen. We can choose to dissect the information and uncover a truth. Um, and we can choose to think critically about what's being fed to us and, and, and make our own informed decisions based on a um, multitude of things that we're consuming, if that makes sense. And always check the sources. There's no source. There's no primary source. It's not a good article. Another <laughs> problem for the, for the media these days in the uh, innovation of social media. Social media has been very detrimental to the stories that we get because uh, there have been lots of people that go online and suddenly they're experts. No training, and no gatekeeping, right? no quality control. So we have lots of garbage that gets out on, on social media. But also because of that, it has actually pulled advertising revenue away from our traditional media channels. Newspapers have suffered severely from that, and so has television and radio. So we've seen, um, well, in Edmond, we have a news desert. The Edmond Sun is no more. It's gone. That's sad. Uh, but we have now fewer reporters everywhere trying to do more work and still cover everything. So that's also part of the problem. What I find amazing that during the Trump administration, we've had a renaissance at the New York Times and the Washington Post. We've, some, we've seen some of the most amazing investigative reporting that's been done in decades. It's because of Donald Trump. Hmm. So there's some good and bad in all of that, but uh, keep in mind, you know, support your local paper. Support your local radio stations, your TV stations, and uh, help them because they're all trying to do a good job. I would just add that without social media, I mean, social media does do those things. It's also so valuable for democratizing the spread of information. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement, for example, would not be Absolutely. as... Um, powerful it is, as it is without Instagram and, and social media and um, spreading that information without having to go through any gatekeepers um, has really led to some 
really important and impactful social movements, but it just means that we, the reader, the viewer of that thing, have to check to make sure that whatever we're looking at um, is a truthful thing, you know? I saw a meme, or somebody told me about it today. Uh, after the inauguration, my neighbor will have to go from being a constitutional uh, expert to be, <laughs> to, you know, to being a, uh, a public health expert, so. <laughs> Yeah, I think what I what I kind of sense as the subtext is trust in the media, I guess, is what I'm sort of sensing in the air. Um, what, what do you mean? Like, um, we once upon a time took for granted that what we read in the newspaper was correct sure. and true. And we never had to check to make sure that it was correct and true. But that's no longer how everyone gets their news. Well, they get and, that, it on and that was never true. So right. we, we've grown up a little bit when it comes to that. Yeah, and I think that's great. Sure. Because it gives us a healthy skepticism and it promotes personal responsibility for well, what information you you're consume. You're too young to remember when Walter Cronkite would end his 23 minutes. I remember Walter Cronkite. And say, and, say, and that's the way it is, yes. Yes. January the 15th, mm -hmm. 2021. Well, it was never the way it was. It was 23 <laughs> minutes of what he thought we needed to According to Walter to hear, Cronkite, right? that's the way it is. So, and it was wonderful. Everybody, all of us, were part of that story. It's, it is the way it is. Well, it was never that way. It mm. was one person's version in one network of what we, he thought we were. So I think it is true. I mean, we have grown up and it is a healthy, healthy thing, no matter whether it's a blog on uh, the internet, or if it's the most respected reporter in the New York Times, you know, mm. it, the article may get full of half truths, flat out falsehoods, mm -hmm. illogical conclusions, et cetera, et cetera. I read one this week in the New York Times that would, that would get a failing grade in a uh, logic class <laughs> because the guy was an advocate, not a reporter, so. Mm. So. And I think we surround, I mean, we have to be really careful, I think, with any media that we typically will find what we're looking for. And that if you pull up your Twitter feed, it's probably full of the things that align with who you are. We don't typically follow things that are opposing views of ours. But that is how we get to know why somebody is leading that story the way they are, mm -hmm. by at least paying a little bit of attention to the opposing story. Um, with a critical eye and ear, <laughs> right? Not take it in and become it, but just read to understand, I guess. Yeah, I think confirmation bias was not so spoken of uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago, but now more people are aware of what it is um, at the very least. And I think we're definitely more in we're, I'm giving us, I'm going to go ahead and give us credit. We're definitely more <laughs> informed, uh, in, in my opinion, than we were before about what confirmation bias is, what a primary source is. Um, those are things that we just kind of took for granted as fact. The news was fact before. Were there any other comments or questions for anybody on the panel? or in general? I just wanted to say thank you that Otto, um, I don't know very many people who have the courage or the bravery to jump into a caravan to be able to tell that story um, from a first person perspective. And, um, and I really appreciate this opportunity for you to be in Oklahoma. And I hope that we get a lot of people here to kind of bear witness to this. So oh, thank you. I'm glad you like the thank you. Well, on that note, I will say thank you to everybody, all the panelists, everyone viewing at home on your phones, on your computers, everybody who attended here today. Thank you all so much. I really, I really appreciate you taking the time to attend this panel discussion. Thank you. Let's give everybody a round of applause. I'm gonna turn the lights up and you all are welcome to take, take a look at the work and you know, feel free to stay and enjoy the work. <laughs>